I'm back in California again, and that is the Griffith Observatory. I got sucked up reading a book and spent about three hours in the cafe that they have back there, which is called the Cafe at the End of the Universe. It's charming. I feel I belong there. One thing that came to my attention when I was in the observatory uh, was an exhibit where they were talking about the depths of deep space. And I wanted to bring this up because a lot of people when they conceive of the, the, the grandeur and the scope of the universe, talk about being humbled by it. And I was associated the word humble with uh, a kind of smallness, um, a kind of um, insignificance. I think it's, what really happens is that you don't get you don't feel insignificant, or at least I don't. I, I don't feel insignificant when considering that vastness. What I feel like is rather than, yes, I, in regards to the rest of the universe, I am a speck of dust. But, you have to remember, you, know, you still come back to me. I'm still me. I didn't change. Even if you go to the edge of the universe in your mind and come back, I didn't change. I, I'm the same as I always was in some regards. What changed is that, you know, I didn't become smaller in my mental universe. My mental universe just got bigger. That's what happened. And so, that is why I hesitate to use the word humbled. But I wanted to describe to you that feeling to me, anyway. On my trip down here from Canada, I got a fabulous audiobook on CD that I was listening to. Where on earth is it? Oh, here. It is called The Telltale Brain by Dr. Ramachandran. Dr. Ramachandran did a fascinating lecture on art which impressed the hell out of me. He also did another um, TV program called Phantoms in the Brain, which is uh, on YouTube as well, which I will also link to, and that was absolutely amazing as well. Another thing I stumbled upon recently was, well, relatively recently, a couple of months ago, uh, was a lecture, another lecture on TED Talks. It, I think it was called Your Brain on Love, which I will also put a link to. She connected hormone levels, particular hormones, with clusters of personality traits. So um, what she is testing, even though personality is a culmination of nature and nurture, what she was, uh, her, her model for personality typing is based entirely on... Uh, nature, not the nurture aspect. I was up at the observatory reading this book which I picked up because I think that this, uh, if this theory is at all credible, it could be applied to how you pick your friends, not just your partners, obviously, and also who you get along well with, right? Obviously, and who you don't. Um, you know, you either just click with people you don't, and what's the basis on that? Because everybody has it. Sometimes you just click with somebody you don't, you just like somebody you don't. But why? I mean, you could attribute it to a specific trait, but it's more than that, though, isn't it? You didn't base your entire dislike or like of somebody on just one incident that they did. Or a mannerism, or, or, or a posture. It's a combination of manners and posture and specific events. So what she proposed was a theory to explain that. There, there's many examples of atheists and uh, theists, like Christians and stuff, who have a stable, loving, very understanding uh, marriage and relationship. And why they can do that, and I would find that concept almost unimaginable. I could not ever picture myself having even a, anything like I mean, maybe a casual friendship, maybe, with a Christian or, or some other religious person, but n I, I, could, I couldn't picture having a deeper friendship with a Christian, n I mean, forget relationship. Um, and so why can some people do this and not me, right? I mean, obviously these people have these relationships. I've spent time with them, I've talked to them, they're not fooling themselves, they really do have a good relationship. So why do they do it? And I would find that unimaginable. And I, I've talked to other people who honestly have no problem with that kind of friendship relationship, and people who just cannot picture it. Helen Fisher's theory outlines 
to me a uh, a theory as to why that is or why that could be, which makes sense to me um, so far. If it doesn't, like if I try and apply these principles to everyday life and it ends up that it just doesn't fit easily, because one thing I would I would hate to because I I I so I so ruthlessly criticize uh, people who use horoscopes and conspiracy theories for just quickly connecting the dots because they want to see them. And I would be so embarrassed if I did the same thing with a personality theory. A person is generally, according to her theory, summed up by their two most predominant personality groupings that she gives them, which is um, their, their temperament. Now, apparently there's, there's four. There's um, explorer-type personality, builder-type personality, uh, you may have heard of these, director-type personality and negotiator-type personality. And in her lecture, she gives examples of all of these. The way I ranked on, on this uh, personality evaluation was I came out very, very strongly in the director category and secondly in the negotiator category followed closely by uh, explorer category um, and then very weakly in the builder category. One of the reasons why her theory is kind of intriguing to me is because it because she explains a concept called mind blindness which might be applicable to my particular personality grouping. By her outlining of other type of personalities it allows me to build a framework of a theory of mind that does not come intuitively to me. And therefore, if it's correct, it would allow me to logically, theoretically, um, build bridges and help with communication. One of the really fun things to do is apply her basis for theories of mind and personality typings to my friends and uh, partners, and then conduct experiments on them. And also in my personal relationships, sometimes when I try and communicate a problem on more than one occasion I've gotten back from my spouse that uh, this almost look of are you a robot because I <laughs> especially when I'm trying to communicate a very intimate problem or an intimate communication or or especially a very exact feeling I describe it in extremely clinical ways. And so, yeah, I can see why it sounds like I'm a robot, but I can, I sometimes, if I see that look, I'll step back and say, I, pro I know that I sound clinical, but the reason I describe it in such a way is to try to be as exact as I can. And, um even to the extent of knowing who I'm dealing with to incorporate metaphor into my description, even though I hate uh, describing, th uh, generally, I, I dislike trying to be exact in describing things in metaphor. Um, it's not that I don't understand them, I just don't feel that it's eff as effective as being exact. And uh, some people prefer that method of communic communication. And it drives me nuts. I mean, sometimes uh, my partner and I have actually had to learn how to talk to each other because of a communication breakdown. And to avoid getting completely frustrated with each other, we've had to learn how to explain things to each other. Not just explain, but explain them in ways that the other one understands. That makes relationships just better. You know, it doesn't come to a stalemate of, I don't understand you, you don't understand me. I still don't think that I could really be f intimate friends with a Christian or another adamantly religious person. But it bothers me that I truly don't get it, and I would really like to. I would really, really like to understand it to some degree, because other people seem to be able to do this. People achieve ultimate intimacy in different ways. I mean... You know, some people are, are the, the most important and fundamental thing to them is having somebody who they can play with. And this is something that I had already thought of before I had a look at um, uh, Fisher's theory. 
um, and some people uh, achieve intimacy through uh, through through uh, being very dependable, being very predictable, and and loyal, uh, and that's the most important thing. So so necessarily being a theist or an atheist is like a secondary or tertiary factor. My interest is very narrow uh, and very, very, very focused. And so I can't really have fun with a Christian or a theist because for one, I can't place myself in their world because despite the fact that I can think of many reasons why somebody might be uh, why an otherwise normal, intelligent person might be religious, I can think of many reasons why uh, somebody who is otherwise intelligent might be religious. But unfortunately, I cannot think of a single admirable reason why they would be religious. And so I, <laughs> I have an underlying feeling of utter contempt for them. And I don't like that feeling. But I... I but it, it really is there. So, despite the fact that I don't like feeling contempt towards somebody, I mean, what am I going to do? Am I going to just lie and say that I don't? I mean, I would like to find an explanation for that theory and, and, maybe, and maybe come to an understanding rather than simply deny and say I respect their point of view when, frankly, I really don't. And I don't to such a degree that I have contempt for them. Helen Fisher's theory has the seeds of some potentially interesting ideas in it. If I find them applicable, I might use some of them. If if not, I'll just end up throwing them out. But one thing I am always, I try to be hyper aware of is, is not to connect dots that aren't there. And so, sometimes I even hesitate to bring ideas like this up because, I don't know, I, maybe it's a pride issue. I would hate to be connected with uh, people who use astrology. One of the really fun things, actually, especially uh, being in LA, is actually going out, clubbing and socializing, and then trying to uh, see if I can predict personality typings by even just the way people move and how they conduct themselves other people and how they uh, talk and just interact with people and play around with these rules in my head. Not that, I mean, interacting with people is fun too, but, but to have this on the side in my head is extra interesting for me. One of the very best ways to sort out any idea is to try and explain it to somebody else. So this is an interesting experiment. Whilst being fresh from an evening of wonderful interplay of subtle social nuances, whilst unfortunately having to observe it under the influence of being slightly inebriated, and inebriated, never mind. Um, it is extraordinarily fascinating. I wish I could do a David Attenborough style documentary and just sit in the club behind a bush and uh, fit the place out with security cameras and narrate um, subtle nuanced body language between various people. Best part about being able to muse about stuff like this, and especially whilst traveling in your car, is that I get the opportunity to sober up nicely and ramble the camera whilst, you know, without driving anywhere, as these people who are driving beside me are, uh, probably unwisely. <laughs> I feel like I could go out clubbing for an evening and appreciate the experience on, on somewhat of a different level than I, I suspect most other people do. And, um, and I wish I could share that. I really do. I don't know how yet. <clears throat> Sorry. Except all I can really share is my um, uh, enthusiasm for it.